the best um, the best way that I explain to people my experience over there is it was the best the best times of my life and the worst times and I also saw the best of humankind and the worst and um, my mindset never really changed I'm still the same person as I was but it just my, my views on right and wrong were more solidified you know going to war and I feel like me and a lot of my brothers were tested in, in you know, the worst way, uh, and we came out on top. We came out as good people. You know, we never intentionally harmed an innocent, and we always did what was right, even to the point of giving our life up for what was right. Because when you're over there and you're in the thick of it, you're, there's no thoughts of, you know, God, country, core, or anything like that. It's you're fighting for the people to the left and to the right of you, and also for the innocents that are over there that you're meeting every single day and um, and so I just uh, I feel like I have a better view of what's what the right thing to do is now after having been through all of that okay. and do you come from a family of military no nope. okay yeah. so you're you're like the first that you know of in your family for the most part well my namesake uh, you know Brian I had a second my father's second cousin was killed in Vietnam. He was a helicopter door gunner, and that's where I get my first name from. Uh, but other than that, from what I know, nobody else in my family. You know, you, you've had a lot of experience, I assume, through, through the military. Um, what compelled you to join the Marines? Well, ever since I was a... Ever since I could remember, I wanted to join the military. I actually, uh, in high school, I didn't, I didn't have dreams of college or of anything else. I just wanted to join the military. Then 9/11 happened, and that kind of solidified it for me. And uh, I joined. Well, I signed the papers two years after 9/11 in 03, and I went to boot camp in 04, uh, early 04, February to be exact. Okay. Did Did you have any? Um, relation to any of the victims in 9/11, or was it just was it just the the fact that we got attacked? It was the fact that we got attacked, and uh, you know they they told us that hey they, these people are coming from here and we're gonna go get them. And so I've always I've always been a fighter, and I've always kind of stood up for those that that can't stand up for themselves. And I felt it was my duty to join. Um, but I mean, it, it wasn't that 9/11 caused me to join because I already. Prior to that, you know, during the, the short peacetime years that I knew as a kid, I, I still wanted to join the military. But it did, in fact, boost your yes. your ambition to join. Yes. Okay. Now, you know, people join the military for all sorts of reasons. You know, like, uh, you know, people, the kids and stuff, they're like, oh, yeah, guns fighting, you know, shooting guns is fun and cool and stuff. Um, what, what... Um, what inspired you to be, was it, was it like more of a patriotic, maybe something that you learned growing up, or was it more of, you know, I want to go out there and, and, you know, drive big, you know, vehicles and do, you know, cool, you know, things that only you can do in the military? Well, it, it was a little bit of both. It was a, a little bit of patriotic duty, and, uh, you know, I wanted to shoot things and blow things up, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. How old were you when you when you signed? I, I signed the papers when I was uh, about 17 and a half, and I was in the delayed enlistment program for uh, seven, eight months, I believe. And then once I turned 18, um, well, I turned 18 in July, and I went in February. There, there's some really good people over there, and, and the best thing that sticks out in my mind about the people of Iraq and Afghanistan, because I went to both, um, is their hospitality. I mean, you, you walk into a house even at 3 in the morning and you, and you kick down their door because do, you're doing a raid. They're still going to ask you if you want tea, you want food, whatever. And, you know, they'll lay out the spread for you no matter what. And you, even in the face of aggression. <laughs> yep. It's, it's their culture. And um, maybe going off on a tangent here, but I've had some people say, were you ever afraid of eating the food in somebody's house that they might poison it? And not once. Uh, because it's their culture. That's a big no-no. So even your enemy could be giving you food, but you know that it's going to be the best that they have to offer because hospitality is a big part of their culture. Well, that sounds only like an act of love, even in the face of aggression. Um, well, 
you you can tell with the ones that were doing it just because they're supposed to, and then you can tell the ones that were doing it because you know that's how they are. They're good people. It's just like anywhere else. You got bad apples. So, so basically, your perception is just like I would assume your perception would be here in the states that. In general, the majority of people are good people. Right? Yeah. Okay. In the news, we're always hearing the worst case scenario. In every scenario, whether it's in the military or police or even in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Overall, you think that, you know, um, the majority of people acted in the ways that you spoke of? Yep. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of high-profile incidents from those wars and stuff like that. And for the most part... Um, the the media likes to paint stuff in a bad picture, and, and civilians have the misconception that everything's black and white over there, and it's it's not. There's a lot of gray areas, and in the thick of it, when you're just worried about survival, sometimes you may make bad decisions. But then again, there are other people like uh, who was it, Staff Sergeant Bales? He just got uh, sentenced to life without parole for. The, all those Afghan civilians, he left off base by himself, went and killed them, came back, went to another village, killed a bunch of them. There's no, you know, there was no, he was in the thick of the moment and, you know, he reacted wrong. No, he, he took that, that, that choice to go murder innocents. And so there are some cases like that, but I feel for the most part, uh, it was just men acting in combat and survival and, uh, and, you know, now the civilian world who knows nothing of that life that are judging them. So the way I look at it, there's never going to be a shortage of warriors of, you know, American kids that will, you know, die for their country for what their government tells them to do. And it's, it's, it's a treasure. It's something more than actual money than actual treasure. It's something that we need to use wisely. And, you know, I'm not a pacifist. I, if, if, if the homeland got invaded, whatever, I, I would, put the uniform back on but we can't take war lightly we can't just go into these wars where it's an abstract idea of protecting our freedom anymore I, I believe that you know unless it's a direct threat to our freedom we just need to stay out of it 12 12 years of war is too much I, I, I haven't known one day of peacetime throughout my adult life and you know I, I'm sure many other people w would like to, to know some peace too I don't think the majority of people realize that that what they can con that they can actually physically think like consciously mm -hmm. think that throughout their whole life they haven't had any peace. Nope. And it's an amazing shocking kind of conclusion that I think maybe people don't want to want to conceive. Well, you know, unfortunately there there's a popular saying that goes throughout the Marine Corps right now, uh, you know, America's not at war, America's at the mall. The United, the United States Marine Corps and the rest of the military, for that matter, is at war. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's a shame. One, uh, one shocking statistic that I've heard is, is you know, since 9-11, only 0.45% of, of the population has joined the military. Oh, sure. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of a percentage of the population that's shouldered this this great burden for everybody else and nothing wrong with that it's an all-volunteer force everybody should know what they're getting themselves into but it's the indifference and apathy of the rest of america that really bothers me I, like i use this example you know obviously i wasn't alive during them but during the vietnam wars you you were either for the war or you were against it but everybody was very well aware of what was going on Nowadays, you know, the people that are for it and the people that are against it, not necessarily over there fighting it, they're, they're, they're a small percentage of the population, too. The rest of America doesn't... Afghanistan, where's that? Oh, there's still a war going on over there? <laughs> and because the amount of the population was so small <clears throat> that's joined over there, chances are your average everyday American doesn't even know somebody that knows somebody that's over there. Yeah. So unless you have a family member that's over there, you really, you're disconnected from it. Well, sure, it's on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about uh, our government currently training Afghan soldiers over there to, to fight and equipping them? 
Well, weapons. So that's what's currently yeah, going on. Yeah, it's. It, we're not going to get out of there unless they pick up, take up the fight for themselves. The problem is, is our cultural differences are so big. Um, I mean, I was over there as a security contractor as well, and uh, the, you know, the year that I was over there, there was a lot of what you call green on blue incidents, where it's uh, an Afghan soldier, Afghan policeman turning his weapon on Americans, and. Many of them are Taliban and Al Qaeda, Haqqani Network, whatever you name. You name your terrorist organization infiltrators within the Afghan forces that are, you know, just trying to kill Americans. But then there's also a big chunk of those green on blue attacks where it's just the cultural differences. Um, they've got a, it's a big machismo culture over there, and if if you've been dishonored, you you get your honor back by drawing blood. And that's something that we don't understand. And it's, it's leading to that. And it's, it's making a lot of the people that are over there fighting the war just sick of it. You know, why are we giving these people money? Why are we training them if they don't care about us and they're just turning their weapons on us? What, uh, what did you do as a contractor? I, I wouldn't know anything about being a contractor in a foreign land. Well, I was, uh, I was doing uh, <clears throat> uh, protective security details for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and they had, you know, uh, work sites that they would go to, and they were in charge of, you know, doing the reconstruction effort. They, they would uh, build camps, buildings, uh, mainly for the Afghan army and, you know, the Afghan forces, but also um, other, other areas of the Afghan economy. We're just building them stuff and giving that to them. And so my job was to just, you know, get my clients there to their work site safely and, you know, walk around with them while they surveyed it, you know, shook hands, talk to people. And, uh, okay, so one interesting thing that I saw over there um, in, in doing the security contracting and stuff is you would have Afghan army saying, hey, we don't want this facility built. It's out in the middle of the desert. It's, we're not going to use it when you guys leave. And, you know, our government, uh, the Department of Defense, would say, well, we're still building it for you. They would, you know, spend several million dollars on building this project for them, and we'd hand it over to the Afghans. And within three weeks of handing it over to the Afghans, every single door, window, copper wire, ceiling fan, air conditioner would be stripped, sold, money goes into the commander's pocket, and they basically turn it into a mud hut like they're used to. And we're wasting millions giving them this. So the reality of it is, is we're building it up. For them to destroy it. For them to destroy it. Not right. even by war, just by, just by how they the, are. The resources. And they're laughing all the way to the bank. Because this is another thing, um, you know, going back to the thing that I told McCain, you know, there, there's there's cultural differences that we don't understand with these people. And us Americans, we're too nice. These people have been at war since the day, in Afghanistan specifically, they've been at war since Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great. And they only understand prison rules there. You know, the biggest, toughest, baddest guy gets the most respect. And with the Obama administration specifically, and, you know, the Bush administration wasn't much different, They, you know, but the Obama administration has taken this and ran. Instead of dealing with the enemy with two to the chest and one to the head, they're throwing millions of dollars at him, trying to get him on our side, play nice with him, implementing these... Uh, implementing these play nice rules over there that just get American service people killed. You know, they're hoping to buy their way out of that out of that war. And it's not gonna happen because those people don't respect that. They only respect, you know, violence, really. It's sad to say, but uh, you have to rule with an iron fist over there. And there's a saying, war is cruel, and the less cruel you are, the longer it lasts. And unfortunately, you know, that's that's uh, that's what we're doing over there. And now, don't get me wrong. By no means should you ever hurt an innocent. But if your enemy's trying to kill you, uh, you know, there's no holding back with that. If you go to war, you can't have one hand tied. You have your to back. protect yourself. That's a yep. natural instinct. Okay. Wow. And um, you know, it's really confusing over there. We hear all these group names, you know, between Afghanistan and and and, and that whole Middle Eastern area. How many different 
strains, how many different groups are there out there? I mean, including, you know, extreme terrorists to, you know, the guys we're trying to help. Well, there's, I don't know an exact number. I'm not a, I'm not, I was an yeah. intel, you right. know, I was a but gunslinger, is, but is there um, there's... an estimate then? I'd say more, at least a dozen, at least a dozen. But uh, the the two big players in Afghanistan are obviously the Taliban, and then uh, you have the Haqqani network. And the Haqqani network is closely allied with Al Qaeda, and they operate out of Pakistan. They also have ties to the Pakistan ISI, which is you know the Paki version of the CIA, and they'll you know, get resources and everything across the border in Pakistan, they'll jump the border, come do their attacks in Afghanistan, and go right back over. Wow. And that, since I was there in 2005 when I was in the Marine Corps, mind you, I was, you know, 15 kilometers from the Pakistan border, that's always been the biggest tactical disadvantage for us is they're using those border regions, especially in the, in the remote regions where the mountains are and stuff. They just... Jump the border, shoot at us, jump back over, and they're home safe. And uh, so you got you got many groups like that, and they're all they're all loosely affiliated within the whole global jihad movement. And you know they 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 spread their po- propaganda amongst themselves. You know they 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 get funding that way through making videos and making a name for themselves. And um, enterprising. Oh yeah. And which brings me to a, uh, a point here, it, it, it's more lucrative for the Taliban and all the enemy over there to keep this war going than to actually achieve their goals and, you know, get the great Satan out of their country. Because they're all making money off of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's something in the news, I don't, I don't remember what uh, publication it was that put it out, but basically uh, our, our, uh, our government voted to still hand money to Afghan contractors that are tied to terrorist organizations in doing this reconstruction effort. So their profit, so the the people that we are against are, are profiting from the war, mm-hmm. and at the same time our government is helping them profit from the war by funding the other side, yep. by keeping it going. Yep. What... Um, what do you want people without your uh, military experience to understand? I mean, if there's one message that you could try to uh, attempt to convey to everyone out there that, that's like myself, that's just a, a civilian, what, what message would you like to tell them? Well, um, it's, it's a real complicated situation over there, and even the people that have been in the thick of it have a hard time understanding the, 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 the complex relationships between everything over there and the cultural differences, uh, religious differences. Um, so for th- those reasons, we just need to stay the hell out of there. These, these people, we're dying for them. We're going, our nation's going broke for them, and they'll be the first ones to go out there and burn our flag and condemn our way of life. You know, it's, it's, I'm not talking about individual people over there, but as a whole, they, Western society and their mentality just doesn't mix. You know, we need to stay out of there before we start something bigger than, you know, <laughs> that's something we don't want. Well, I, I can definitely understand that. So you, you, you hope that they consider the idea that they may not just understand what's going on. No. And, uh, you know, one another thing that I want to add is it would be nice to see all this uh, nation-building and reconstruction effort go on here in the States. In Detroit. You know? oh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, let's stop throwing money at our enemies and start throwing money at, at our own. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't tend to make money. No. And, and that's unfortunate. So, um... I had the pleasure to actually uh, be able to hear what you had to say to uh, John McCain, mm-hmm. um, and I. The the thing I found most interesting about it was um, that you you made a statement. You weren't you weren't asking him a question like everybody else. You 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 made a statement to him, and you furthermore you weren't even looking for a response you know and and you you showed that by you made you said your piece 
and then you, you proceeded to leave, you know. You wanted to make your voice heard to John McCain uh, and express yourself in that way. What, what inspired you to do that? Well, to be quite honest with you, I feel that most, most politicians out there these days don't really listen to we the people anymore. You know, it's they're public servants. That's what they're supposed to be. But they've strayed away from that. And I figured, you know, considering McCain's record and, you know, how he's done opposite of what his constituents want, he probably wasn't going to, you know, listen to what I said. So I just wanted to, to, you know, give my credentials as to why I know a little bit about what's going on over there and, you know, speak my piece. And I decided to, you know, after I said my piece to leave, uh, but he stopped me, and he stopped me respectfully the first time. So I decided to turn around and hear what he had well, to say. When when you um, when you decided to leave, um, prompted was that something that you you preconceived in doing that? Today's Tuesday. It hasn't even been a week since the McCain no. thing. Um, how has that changed you? Has that changed you in any way? Well, emotionally, or you know, in any way, it's. Uh, it's given me a sense of purpose, and also I've been trying to talk to you know some activists here in town, and my goal is to you know get people from all different ideologies you know together to stop all this infighting, to have one big voice to tell our politicians out there, hey, you work for us, and it's about time that you start listening to us. And since the video, I mean, it's gotten a little bit of a virus, a viral status. People tend to take me more seriously now, and uh, I think that's the best thing that, that's came of that, because they say, hey, look, at this guy isn't just posting stuff on Facebook, he's going out and wanting to talk to these politicians and, you know, tell them from his heart what he, what he, uh, what he has to say. Good. Okay. Yeah, he did stop you. He, yeah. he, he, he said, sir, before you leave, mm -hmm. and, and then without... Any prompting, he, he seemed to answer your statement as if it was a question. Yeah. As if, as if uh, to, to justify um, his side of the story mm -hmm. versus hearing your statement with an open and honest heart, which I assume by your actions, that was your intention. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well that... Um, I, I think what you said was absolutely fabulous. You okay. know, I, I think um, it takes a, a really brave heart, you know, to be able to share what you know, as, as horrible and as, as, as ugly as it can be, you know, the, the realities, your reality of the situation. Um, and... Um, and to actually stand up and share that with someone of authority, someone that not only is of authority, but is also in charge of this country, in charge of what kind of laws and, mm -hmm. and how we are as a people. My name is Brian Bates. I'm a former Marine Infantry Combat Veteran. <laughs> Afghanistan, 2005, also 2006, Hadith Iraq, roughly a year after the incident, which I, I know you're aware of there. Um, I was also a private security contractor working with the Army Corps of Engineers who were leading the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan. I'm no stranger to Al-Qaeda, their affiliates, and the people of the region near Syria. I'm here to tell you that I'm completely opposed to military intervention. differentiate between the good and the bad guys. I have lived amongst the people in that region. I have sat and ate dinner with many people and have been in many houses over there. And I can tell you that although there are many good people in the region, the cultural, religious, and ideological differences from us Americans are too great for us to understand the relationships between the rebels and extremists. We need to stay out of there. Yeah. Yeah. But I do not want to see more brothers and sisters killed for people who will quickly change sides and denounce America as soon as they get the help they want. Yep. I still have many brothers currently serving, and I can speak for the majority of them. 
they oppose any action in Syria as well. You, sir, do not represent me or my people. Exactly. I am glad to as a man of honor, such as yourself, that has sacrificed so much for his country, does not understand the dangers of getting America involved with the situation in Syria. Yeah. Before you leave, sir, um, I thank you for your service to the country. I'm grateful for it. I also have a son who's a Marine, Lance Corporal, served in Iraq, Combat 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. I have a son who's a Navy pilot. They don't share your view. And when you think you speak for the majority of men and women in the military, in my view, you speak for yourself, because I talk to men and women in the military all the time. Come on. And they So, sir, most I have no more time know, for you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Brian. I said, You're a hero. I wouldn't have changed anything I said to him or the way I said it to him. But if I had a second chance to sit down and speak with him, I would. Uh, I would like to tell him that he was wrong. I, I definitely don't just speak for myself, and. Uh, you know, one of the big reasons he gave is because he talks to military families all the time. Well, let me let me fill you in on a little secret there. You talk to some enlisted family, some guy that's active duty or officer for that matter, that's in the military, they're not going to go and tell a U.S. senator exactly what they think. No, they're going to tell the U.S. senator what the U.S. senator wants to hear. So that was his reasoning for disrespecting me and telling me that I only spoke for myself, but he's so... That just shows how disconnected he is. So you're saying it's almost like um, the king's not wearing clothes kind of mentality exactly. for his position. Exactly. Okay.